uh, all our friends over there, come join us by moving closer to the stage. This will also help us and our panelists later on see uh, faces closer to them. Come, come join us, please. So you won't have the ushers help you out. There you go. Some more. Thank you, thank you for those who responded to that invite. Come join us. Take up the front seats. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Good afternoon to one and all. The philosophy department of the Ateneo de Manila University is happy and proud to give you today's special event in honor of Dr. Ramon Castillo Reyes and in remembrance of his legacies as an educator and a philosopher. This afternoon's gathering is extra special because it had taken two years, as you would know, and a pandemic to get us all to this point and to be gathered together in one shared space to honor and remember our beloved teacher, philosophy professor, and colleague, Dr. Ramon Reyes. And so to our audience here on campus and those who are off campus, thank you for taking time to join us today and on behalf of the philosophy department of the Ateneo, I welcome you all to the 2023 Ramon Castillo Reyes Memorial Lectures. The title for today's Memorial Lectures is Remembering Ramon C. Reyes, His Legacies in Doing Philosophy. This event is organized and sponsored by the Department of Philosophy of the Ateneo de Manila University through the Ramon Castillo Reyes PhD Endowment Fund. This endowment fund stipulates that the philosophy department of the Ateneo should, quote, establish and fund for as long as the endowment is in existence an annual academic activity called the Ramon Castillo Reyes PhD Memorial Lecture to sustain his intellectual contributions to and philosophical reflections on ethics and society, as well as a teaching of the history of philosophy. And now, may I ask everyone to please stand for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem to be followed by the invocation. Dr. Wilhelm Patrick Joseph Strebel. Dr. Strebel will also officially begin our event with some welcome remarks. Today, dear Lord, we commemorate the life and thought of our beloved teacher and colleague, Ramon Castillo Reyes. We thank you for bequeathing us such a person whose life, passion, and dedication left indelible marks on all of us gathered here today. Guide us, please, that we may continue to cherish, develop, and bring to good fruit everything we receive from you. It has been nine years since Doc Ramon's passing on the 17th of June, uh, January 2014. We continue to remember him in our prayers and seek your mercy on all of us. 
Through your blessed mother, we now pray for Dr. Ramon. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Recording in progress. For sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Bobby Up. Yes, please be seated. Thank you, Dot, for the introduction. Father Bobby Up, Dr. Jonathan Chua, both of them are on Zoom. Mrs. Nena Alcoas Reyes, Rafa Reyes, and all of Dr. Ramon's family and friends. Our esteemed panelists on site, practitioners of philosophy, teachers, some students, all, tech assistants, participants on Zoom and YouTube, good afternoon. To our esteemed panelists joining us from Western Europe, good morning. It is my great honor and privilege to welcome you here. After we hibernated for two years, we now resume the annual Ramon Castillo Reyes Memorial Lectures. The memoirs of our panelists may transpose my generation back to a classroom in Schmidt Hall where we diligently followed the thoughts and ideas of the brilliant teacher who was Dr. Reyes. Not minding that the scribblings on the blackboard were as unintelligible to us as the periodic table above it. But I remember Doc Ramon better as the seasoned colleague who sat at conversation with his wit and gentle character. You see, I firmly believe that philosophy cannot be taught by compelling argument, nor by systems of thought. Well, you have to admit that Kant's thoughts were awesome. But I stand here as chair of the Ateneo Department of Philosophy, not because I was awed by logical proofs, but because I was inspired by mentors who devoted their lives to the values that they hold dear. I can only continue, I guess, as a teacher by not ceasing to be a student. And with that, to open our event, I give you another Doc Reyes Padawan, Father Roberto Yap of the Society of Jesus, President of the Ateneo de Manila University, joining us via Zoom. Father Bobby. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I was invited, invited to this uh, memorial lecture, and um, I immediately accepted because uh, I actually took, took uh, Dr. Grace's Philo 104 class twice. I'm, I'm a slow, slow learner, learner in that sense. <laughs> uh, I, I took, took him when I was uh, not yet a Jesuit. I was fourth year college. And, and I had, had it for a 104 course in 1979. And then um, when, when I was a Jesuit already in 1985, preparing for philosophy comprehensive, as we needed to do as uh, Jesuit scholastics, I took, took his uh, course again just to review. And um, it, it's amazing you don't remember many course outlines from the many courses you took. But, but uh, for, for the, the course, course of Dr. Reyes's Philo 104, it, 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 I have very, very good memories about it. I knew that, that uh, we reviewed, he presented certain um, uh, frameworks for moral reflection. I remember he did Italianism, he did St. Thomas, Thomas, he did it Kant, and he did it his own synthesis about, about it. I remember proximate foundations and ultimate foundations of morality. Um, I, I also remember, remember how, he, how, how much he used the blackboard. blackboard. There were no PowerPoint slides at that time, but uh, how, how he would fill the blackboard. I still I remember some of his uh, stories that he would tell. tell. Uh, but, but again, uh, never. Uh, uh, it was really, really a privilege to have, to have a, a great, clear thinker and really enter into this world of philosophy and think deeply about um, the moral life and, uh, and how we. We can, can reflect, reflect about it, it and 
especially to guide your own decision making. Uh, I think, think to me, the operations is an Ateneo uh, culture bearer, in a sense, and, and also a real, real icon for the Ateneo. Yeah, it's a real privilege for me to be able to be his student, to be able to study uh, moral philosophy under him. So, so I was, I was very, very glad, glad and to learn that, that uh, this, this uh, memorial lectures in his honor continue and that we are holding it. And I'm very happy to be part of this celebration of his legacies in doing philosophy. So on behalf of the Atene de Manila, I'd really like to thank uh, the philosophy department, the thank the Reyes family. And uh, it's really wonderful to gather and remember Doc Reyes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dagang salamat, marami salamat, Father Bobby, Doc, TJ, thank you. Friends, our program today follows the format of a panel discussion. For everyone's benefit, we have assembled a distinguished set of four panelists who all have a deep understanding of how Dr. Ramon Reyes had imprinted his own philosophy and ways of doing philosophy upon the hearts and minds of thousands of Athenians. The foundations of the philosophy department, the humanities tradition in the Ateneo, and the teaching of philosophy in the Philippines. Our four panelists themselves have been touched and influenced by Dr. Reyes's thoughts on certain specialized topics that they are now going to discuss with us. Each of our panelists will offer a 10-minute lecture or presentation that will introduce us to the insights and thoughts of Dr. Ramon Reyes in relation to the topic individually assigned to them. Such an introduction will be based on an identified text or insight from Dr. Reyes. The panel discussion that follows the four presentations will then attempt to thematize and synthesize those texts and insights. Please note that aligned with Ateneo's own adaptation to flexible learning, two of our panelists will be joining us and presenting their thoughts via, via digital links from Belgium and France while the other two will be present, presenting live and in person here in this venue. Note also that the audience to uh, the sharing of our four panelists is made up of people in this venue and those who are joining us virtually through Zoom and YouTube. And so without further delay, we are pleased to introduce the first of four Ramon Castillo Reyes Memorial Lectures this afternoon. Our first lecturer and panelist is Attorney Jose Salvador Mirasol. Attorney Mirasol will touch on Dr. Reyes's thoughts on the topic of social philosophy. Attorney Zaldi, Zaldi completed his AB philosophy studies in 1980 at the Ateneo de Manila University, cum laude. From 1980 until 1988, he served as a full-time faculty of the philosophy department and obtained a Bachelor of Laws degree, cum laude, and class valedictorian from the College of Law, University of the Philippines. Attorney Mirasol then served as a professor of law at UP, as well as a faculty member of the Commercial Law Department of the Philippine Judicial Academy Supreme Court. He joined the Romulo Law Offices in 1989 as an associate, and to this day continues to work in the same firm as a senior partner who specializes as head of corporate banking and finance practice. Friends, please welcome Attorney Zaldi Mirasol. Thank you, Mrs. Reyes, Annie. I was more than halfway through preparing for today's talk when I received John Bulaong's email the other day, reminding us that the talk today is not intended to be an academic paper, but the sharing of memories, impressions, and anecdotes about Dr. Reyes in connection, in my case, with social philosophy and philosophy of law. Oh no, I told John, what I prepared is very academic. For how can one talk about Doc's legacy in doing a philosophy of law or social philosophy without starting with a reflection on consciousness, intersubjectivity, historicity, and being. 
how can one do a philosophy of law without tracing the history of Western thought, at least beginning from the Greeks whose city-state and teleology served as the conceptual framework of Roman law that eventually gave rise to the civil law tradition that the Philippines still uses today thanks to Spain. And along that line, how can one do a philosophy of law without understanding the paradigm shift brought about by the Copernican revolution, the scientific revolution, which ushered in modern philosophy and eventually postmodern philosophy, both in continental Europe and in Great Britain. When philosophy now refocuses from being out there onto consciousness as it encounters being, and how this new paradigm now serves as a springboard for the other great legal tradition, the so-called common law, which we encounter in many jurisdictions in the legal field. As a practicing lawyer for the last 33 years, I noted to John that I can say that philosophy has always permeated the way I view not only life, but law itself the way I analyze and find approaches to legal problems, the way I write legal opinions and render advice, reflection, uncovering the conditions of possibility, telos, the assumptions of consciousness. Indeed, philosophy as taught to me by Doc Reyes is so embedded in my worldview that it takes a conscious effort to distinguish his from mine, in my case. When confronted with moral legal issues like the separation of church and state, or the recent reversal by the US Supreme Court of Roe versus Wade, part of my views would always be considering how Doc would have approached the same issue. And as I was discussing this dilemma with John, the insight came. Indeed, here is one of Doc's most important legacies, that what he taught was not just philosophy, but how to philosophize. And so I'd like to talk now about Doc as the philosophy teacher. More than just the what, content, what did Kant say, what did Hegel say, it was always for Doc about the how. How would Kant have viewed this? How would Hegel have viewed this? Which would lead eventually to the why. Why did Kant see reason the way he did or Hegel the way he did? The how, of course, was philosophical reflection that mode of thinking in which reason or consciousness turns in upon itself to unravel being in its ultimacy and totality. The ultimate foundation, the structure, the essence of being, of our consciousness of being, of our knowledge of being, of the meaning we give to being in view of its totality. But while that may be reflection in general, there was a certain distinctness about how Doc taught philosophical reflection. And here is what I would call the Doc brand of reflection. One, reflection for Doc was always structural, interrelational. BJ was saying er earlier about all the drawings on the board. Yeah, I was about to say the same. Remember all those boxes and circles and arrows and lines and boxes within boxes and the web of connections that somehow still form part of a meaningful whole. 
this was more than just for me a pedagogical technique. It was Doc's active illustration of one, the interrelatedness of being, the complexity, the dynamicity, and the interplay of parts to form the whole, of the need for human reason to grasp and appreciate relations, causalities, influences between and among things, events, and to do so in their totality. And this in order to, to realize the eventual simplicity of the truth. When everything, of course, finally falls into place. On an even deeper level, it was his way of illustrating what I thought was the Hegelian dialectic the necessity of the mind to be alienated from itself in order to be reconciled back to itself, albeit now at a higher level. But just as Doc's, uh, Doc's teachings were always, in my view, structural, so too was it always historical. When he wrote about the Aristotelian phronesis, one needs to understand the Greek worldview and teleology just as when he talked of Kant's categorical imperative, one needs to see this in the context of the Copernican revolution and the Cartesian cogito. But this is not to say that philosophical realities and truths are historical and therefore merely situational or relative. Through the historical approach, Doc always managed to unravel the transcendental, the universal validity of the insight becomes manifest. I would quote to myself sometimes, uh, the virtually unconditioned. Starting with the historical in its concreteness and arriving at the transcendental truth that somehow goes beyond the confines of history itself, although manifesting itself always in a historical setting. And yet, any such transcendental universal insight is never frozen and perfected. As history unfolds, so does the insight, and thus the need for openness on one part, on one's part. Later on in his writings, I think he may have found support in Heidegger, the historicity of man and relatedly hermeneutics were topics we hardly discussed in class in the late 1970s, but topics showing a lot of interest in beginning in the beginning of the 1980s during casual conversations in the Philo department. What may have started as an implicit recognition on his part seems to have evolved into a conscious embrace of the utter rootedness of consciousness in language and history so that from a Hegelian absolute spirit, there was in Doc's quest an evolution into a historical being in the world, or Dasein. Doc as teacher, we now talk about Doc as the student of philosophy. I obtained my AB philosophy degree in the 1980 and as a full-time member of the Philo department from 1980 to 1988, as um, Dennis uh, mentioned earlier. As a philo major, I felt privileged to have enrolled in Doc Reyes's classes in PH Philo 101, 104, Foundations of Moral Value, Modern Philosophy, and Contemporary Philosophy, which incidentally I took in my sophomore year at the advice of Eddie Boy Calasans, who's in the panel. I was, I, in fact, had Doc, had Doc taught other subjects during that time, I would have enrolled in them as well. In his history courses, Doc covered Descartes, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Marx, and Husserl, 
covering also Aristotle and St. Thomas, along with Kant, of course, and as Father Bobby said, the utilitarians in his uh, Philo 104 class. Back then, we perceived Doc as being Kantian Hegelian, not the least because his doctoral dissertation was on Eric Weil, who was a so-called Kantian Hegelian. It was always interesting for me then to observe Doc go into Heidegger, Gadamer, Derrida, to go into Wittgenstein, and the other philosophers whose views seem to have been quite opposed to the Kantian Hegelian perspective of being. Casual conversations in the, in the department in between classes would invariably go into new book acquisitions he had, new ideas and developments in philosophy. What was especially striking was that Heidegger or Gadamer, for instance, was not just a further elucidation following his Kantian Hegelian base, as it were, but another moment in the dialectic, as it were. Such display of openness, I thought such embrace of opposites. And this, for me, showed Doc as a student of philosophy, indeed a true disciple of the search for truth, committed to his craft, ever searching for the truth, humble in the realization that there is more to learn and discover, untiring in his quest for wisdom. Finally, Doc as the philosopher. While we knew Doc Reyes as a teacher of philosophy, some of us may also have known him as a student of philosophy, and yet reflecting on his lectures, his writings, and his works, I think that more than being just a teacher and student of philosophy, Doc was a philosopher in his own right, an original thinker. This is probably a bold and controversial claim, but allow me to state a few points in support of this. I have still to hear of a philosopher who would do a philosophy of consciousness in which consciousness is depicted as aware of itself, thrown into history, which on the one hand influences his worldview through language, culture, tradition, values, but which, on the other hand, is a project unto himself that he can shape into a communal goal. The reconciliation of various philosophies in this one statement, I think, something that Doc did during his in his teachings is remarkably original. Or the fact that as consciousness which in its encounter with being is intermediated by language and is thus in constant interaction and intermediation with meaning and being, gives meaning to being even as it itself is being given meaning by being. Very doc, in my view, very original or that in its consciousness which is capable at every moment to overcome in his, its historicity and encounter an absolute, that in the understanding of the human person starts with an understanding of his history and yet finding the transcendent in the historical, the cord that binds the present to the past and to the future. Again, for me, very doc, very original. Finally, the role of man, that in appreciating this is how to bring out reason, the good in the context of the particular milieu in which the encounter happens. So I leave it at this. I'm sorry, I may have eaten a little more time, uh, but um, I thank you, but in the end, I would just summarize my recollections of the legacies of Doc Reyes as being embodied in his being a teacher, a student, a perpetual student of philosophy, 
and in himself a philosopher in his own right. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Zaldi. Folks, our second lecturer and panelist is Professor Eduardo Calasanz. Professor Calasanz is joining us from France and will talk to us about modern and contemporary philosophy from the standpoint of Dr. Reyes's thoughts and insights. Sir Eddie Boy, as he is fondly called by students, colleagues, and friends, studied at the Ateneo de Manila University and in Azong Provence. At the Ateneo, he served as chair of the philosophy department, chair of the English department, director of the pre-divinity program, and associate dean for academic affairs. He was also assistant professor of philosophy when he retired from the university at the end of 2019. Please welcome that one person whom we really miss in the philosophy department, Professor Ediboy Calasanz. Thank you, Doc. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I was never Ramon Reyes's student in the history of modern and contemporary philosophy. I shifted to philosophy from biology when I was in second year college. Dr. Reyes was the chair of the philosophy department and he accepted me into the program and told me that for my first semester as a philosophy major, I should take contemporary philosophy under Father Joseph O'Hare, who was leaving the university for uh, New York at that time. I gave the same advice as Saldi mentioned to Saldi Mirasol uh, almost 10 years later. And when it was time for me to take modern philosophy, Ramon Reyes took his sabbatical leave, and I had to take the course under Father Vitaliano Gorosco. It was something I never forgave Dr. Reyes for, and I told him that. Still, I learned much from him concerning modern and contemporary philosophy, the studying of it and the teaching of it, during our untiring and never-ending exchanges in the philosophy department over coffee, or when we were younger in the college quadrangle under the acacia trees. As far as I know, Dr. Reyes never wrote anything which expressed his ideas on doing the history of philosophy. But I think that Paul Ricoeur's article on the history of philosophy and the unity of truth, first published in a face shrift for Carl Jaspers in 1953, and later on included in the book History and Truth, sheds light on the attitudes and approaches of Dr. Reyes in the teaching of the history of modern and contemporary philosophy. First point. The history of philosophy is constitutive of the act of philosophizing because of the historicity of the human person and of the philosopher. Philosophy continues because the history of philosophy continues to render Plato and Aristotle, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, Descartes and Kant, Heidegger and Wittgenstein present to us and drawing us in their company to converse with them about what is going on in our lives, what is happening, what is. 
On the one hand, the history of philosophy instructs us. But on the other hand, it also disappoints us. Because it seems to show, it seems to show us a lineup of different opinions, always pretending to, but never attaining the one truth. Skepticism, then, seems to be the ultimate lesson of the history of philosophy. And to refuse this is to fall into dogmatism as the only other alternative. On the one hand, the vulgar solution of eclecticism, Descartes said this, Spinoza said that, Hume said this, Malbranche said that, etc. A sort of doxography, a lineup of opinions. On the other hand, the elegant solution of proposing an immanent logic of the history of philosophy, locating a center or pinnacle of truth against which everything else is preparation, ingredient, decadence, or apostasy. Vulgar eclecticism or elegant immanent logic of the history of philosophy, both seem to be untenable alternatives for Ramon Reyes. He was familiar with this approach. It was the approach of someone like Hegel, for whom the history of philosophy, the history of the knowledge of the absolute of itself, ended up finally with his own, with Hegel's philosophy. Dr. Reyes was also familiar with the approach of Etienne Gilson, who located the central truth of the history of philosophy in the Middle Ages with St. Thomas. And even in, con in the contemporary period, Dr. Reyes was familiar with a history of philosophy of someone like Martin Heidegger, who located the original, the originary, aletheia, manifestation, unveiling of being with the pre-Socratics at the dawn of the history of philosophy. But these approaches reduce philosophies to an inventory of doctrine, a sort of doxography, different answers to the same questions. But are the questions really and simply the same? Second point. To understand the philosophy is to understand its originary question and its central intuition. What the question allows us to see what the question renders manifest. In this sense, what is at the heart of Descartes' philosophy is not so much the cogito, but rather the question, how can I be sure? The whole problematic of certainty. How can I be certain that what I perceive is what is? How can I reach the indubitable or apodictic what is beyond the always doubtful what is perceived? The originality of a great philosopher lies in the originality of his question. It is true that Kant, later on, asked the same question 
as Descartes. What can I know? But the fact that this question is immediately linked to two other questions that Descartes never asked, at least in his philosophy, changes the flavor of the question, not only the flavor of the question, but reconstitutes it towards other directions. For, for Kant links the question, what can I know? With the two other questions, what must I do? What can I hope for? And this reorients his epistemology otherwise. The point is not just what is Nietzsche saying, but what is he asking in the first place? What is he looking for? In a sense, the question is more important, more fundamental, more life-changing than the answers. Third point. But what happens to the notion of truth in this perspective of the history of philosophy? Doesn't it remain imprisoned in a methodologically necessary epoche or suspension? The history of philosophy then becomes an alibi for not doing philosophy. That is to say, for not seeking the truth. One then hides behind or becomes lost in history in order to avoid affirming anything or committing oneself. Between relativism and absolutism, is there no aufhebung or higher reconciliation or synthesis? Returning to the things themselves, Returning to the concrete experience of the act of philosophizing, one discovers that the search for truth takes place between two poles. On the one hand, a personal situation. On the other hand, an intention, a stretching forth towards what is. I am situated, and this situation is an invitation to ask a question that no one else can ask in my place. On the other hand, I, I aspire to say a word valid and valuable for everyone that arises from the depth of my singularity in order to reach some sort of universality. I want to say not just what pleases me, but what is. In this way, the search for truth is always irremediably caught between my finitude and the totality of what is between situation and openness, between facticity and transcendence. To continue to search for truth, there is only one way, communication, dialogue, speech, exchange. To search for truth becomes communication communicative action, as Habermas would say, a loving struggle, as Jaspers would say. It is not therefore surprising that, as uh, Attorney Saldi already pointed out, in the teaching of the history of Western philosophy, Dr. Reyes paid more and more attention in his later years 
to language, to discourse, to speech. Studying not only Habermas, but Karl Otto Appel beyond Heidegger. Finally, the ultimate lesson perhaps in studying the history of philosophy is one of hope. I can never say I have the truth. I have reached the truth. I possess the truth. But I must say I hope to be in the truth. There are moments when I experience that I am already in the truth, surrounded by it as in a clearing of light where things fall into place and I can go on. But it is never final. It is never complete. For truth is ever greater, as St. Augustine said of God, Deus semper maior. The clearing points to a horizon already and not yet, never fully known, never finally done but always hoped for. Maraming salamat. Sir Eddie Boy, thank you. Thank you very much. Our third lecturer and panelist who is virtually with us from Belgium is Dr. Liovino Maria Garcia. Dr. Garcia will talk to us about Dr. Reyes's view or views on the ground and norm of morality. Dr. Garcia obtained his PhD philosophy magna cum laude from the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium, 1981. From 1988 to 1994, he served as the first lay dean of the Ateneo de Manila's School of Arts and Sciences and the first dean of the Loyola School of Humanities from 2000 to 2007. The Ateneo honored him with a Lifetime Achievement Award in the Humanities in 2007. Dr. Leo has also served as president of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines, Asian Association of Catholic Philosophers, and the World Congress of Catholic University Institutions of Philosophy. Friends, please welcome Dr. Leo Garcia. Um, good morning to everyone and good evening to everyone. Uh, my piece here is uh, my text, my short text is entitled A Plea for an Ethical Society. And I begin by the first part begins with a remembering of Ramon Reyes. I remember Dr. Ramon Castillo Reyes because I owe him a great debt. In July 1966, when I didn't know any French at all, he drafted for me a letter in French requesting the University of Louvain for a scholarship in philosophy. Today, I and we especially remember and thank Dr. Ramon Reyes for being a pioneer in building a fruitful collaboration between Jesuits and lay faculty. Uh, I began teaching at the same time as Dr. Reyes in 1965 when half of the faculty were still Jesuits and there were just a couple of women professors. In internationalizing the Ateneo philosophy department and in promoting the quality 
of university education in Philippine universities through his long service as president of PAASCU, which is the Philippine Accrediting Association for Colleges, Schools, and Universities. We thank him for giving almost half a century of dedicated teaching and selfless service to our beloved Ateneo University. I like to remember Ramon as a noble, gentle, compassionate teacher philosopher who loves Nena, Pao, and Rafa. And I remember especially his unique smile akin to Descartes' smile, the smile of someone who succeeded in distinguishing what is right from what is wrong, what is essential from the inessential, and who lived the good life. Now I will go to my short text composed of three sections. The first section is on terms and uh, the terms ethics and morality. On page one of Reyes's book, which is Ground and Norm of Morality, Ethics for College Students, we read, and I quote, etymologically, the word ethics comes from the Greek word ethos, meaning customs, usage, character. The Roman language and culture, which inherited the Greek culture, express the same concepts in the word mores, which in turn is the root of the words morality, moral, and morals. We see then that ethics and morals are ordinarily used as equivalent terms. In this talk, I would like to extend the legacies of uh, Dr. Reyes by complementing it with Paul Ricoeur's view of ethics. And I am encouraged in this pursuit as Dr. Reyes was familiar with the writings of Paul Ricoeur. In his book, in his dissertation published in 1979, which is Eric Weil's Political Philosophy, Reyes lists in his bibliography Ricoeur's review of Eric Weil's book entitled Philosophy Politique and six articles by Paul Ricoeur from 1954 to 1974. So during his later years, he read uh, a lot of Ricoeur. So I go now to the second uh, section of my text, Ricoeur's Ethics. Ricoeur agrees with Reyes that the words ethics comes from the Greek and morality from the Latin. Recur, however, stresses that ethics is a deep wish or desire for the good. Uh, for recur, ethics is optative, meaning to say, opting some, something that one chooses and decides to do. Recur relates morality to the law or, or norm of what is permitted or forbidden. The law introduces aspects of universality and obligation. Whereas ethics is optative, morality is imperative. Now, Recur developed what he called his little ethics in the book, Oneself as Another. And he defines ethics in three parts, as aiming at the good life, first component, with and for others, second component, in just institutions, third component, because 
he wants to stretch the philosophical anthropology to the social political philosophy. So Ricard tells us that it is by convention that he reserves ethics for the aim of an accomplished life and the term morality for the articulation of this aim in norms which are characterized by universality and constraint. He also points out that it is easy to recognize in the distinction aim and norm, the opposition between two heritages and Aristotelian heritage and which is teleological and a Kantian heritage where morality is defined by obligation and norm, hence deontological. And I think Ramon wouldn't mind this, what I am going to say, because I think he would agree with Ricoeur uh, when, when Ricoeur says that without concerning himself about Aristotelian or Kantian orthodoxy, although not without paying close attention to the founding text, uh, Ricoeur then proposes the following order. First, the primacy of ethics over morality. Second, the necessity for the ethical aim to pass through the sieve of the norm. And third, the legitimacy of a return by the norm to the aim whenever the norm leads to practical difficulties. In other words, uh, according to Ricoeur's working hypothesis, morality is held to constitute only a limited, although legitimate and even indispensable actualization of the ethical aim and ethics would then encompass morality. So he is saying we should stress more this distinctive, this, uh, this aiming for the good life, this aiming for happiness, instead of first commanding rules and commands. In other words, in Ricoeur's view, there will be no attempt to substitute Kant for Aristotle Instead, between the two traditions, he shall establish a relation which is dialectical of subordination and complementarity between ethics and morality. So we should stress ethics more in morality courses. So one has to distinguish, therefore, three moments in ethics, the ethical aim of what esteems as good, more Aristotelian, and second, the moral norm of what imposes itself as duty and obligation, more Kantian, and what uh, unique recur, what is uniquely recurrent, the recourse to phronesis, which is mentioned by the uh, attorney Mirasol as practical mediation or practical wisdom. And this triadic definition unites the self in its original capacity of esteem to the other, the personal other, made manifest by his face and to the third parties or impersonal others, but not anonymous ones who are the bearer of rights on the social and 
political plane. And that is why recur, instead of using love on the personal level, uses, uses the secular term solicitude for the other and justice for the third party. So second, as for the passage from ethics to morality with its imperatives and prohibitions, this seemed to me to recur, to be called for by ethics itself as soon as the wish for a good life runs up against violence. And surely violence turns up whenever there are two persons, there, are, there is already the possibility of conflict. So uh, Ricoeur is saying that we often uh, go beyond mutual friendship where there is a middle point between I and the other. Uh, and uh, he says, the respect of the other and even of the I or self answers to the moral level of esteem of self and of the other, which accomplishes mutual friendship on the ethical level uh, that is for the second component in the same way as the principles of equitable justice answer to the wish of living together, which establishes the common good. So there is a stress on doing good, uh, especially uh, equitable justice to the people that we constantly meet. It will then remain to show in what way the conflicts closely linked to the deontological moment lead us back from morality to ethics, but to an ethics enriched by the passage through the norm and exercising moral judgment in a given situation. So uh, Recur is referring here to those situations which he calls situations of ethical distress in which the choice is not between the good and the bad, but between bad and worse, between gray and gray, between black and black. And so practical wisdom, ronesis, consists in inventing conduct or behavior that will best satisfy the exception required by solicitude by betraying the rule to the smallest extent possible. So what Recur is saying is of course that there are rules to be obeyed, but there are instances whereby one goes beyond the rules. And I remember reading a previous text by attorney Mirasol, wherein Dr. Reyes uh, displayed his going beyond the rules uh, when we were voting for the, um, for the uh, philosophy student who would get the award for the philosophy medal, where Dr. Reyes insisted that even half-time faculty members should vote because the whole department was voting for the, the, uh, this student. Um, so uh, I, I have a third section but I will not read it anymore, which is the capable human being. Uh, this is the theme of the later recur 
of the subject who speaks, who acts, narrates itself, and holds itself responsible, this uh, which he discusses in uh, the two big books of his later period, oneself as another, and memory, history, forgetting. And uh, I just end that the, uh, the philosopher is reflecting for the reflective equilibrium, which uh, Mr. Kalasans also referred to because uh, Ricoeur and Dr. Reyes in philosophizing, their approach consists in reminding us these two aspects of being human, two aspects of our humanity, which are responsible and vulnerable, incapable and capable, fragile and always striving for constant renewal. And I end with this note on practical wisdom. Why is the theme of practical wisdom introduced in tragic situations? This indicates that ethics is caught up in situations of conflict and sometimes unsolvable dilemmas. Recur kept repeating throughout his writings that the more complex a society becomes, the more the, the more con, uh, the more com complex a society becomes, the more conflictual it becomes. And therefore, we have to watch as as it uh, as a society becomes, complex with institutions and we should uh, we should strive to do goodness in institutions and teaching is an institution and therefore we have to uh, do uh, we have to teach therefore uh, what is good not only, in personal situations, but in situations of moral distress. Maraming salamat sa inyo. Thank you. Doc Leo, maraming maraming salamat din po. Friends, Friends our final lecturer and panelist is Dr. Manuel D who is here to talk to us about Dr. Reyes's ideas on phenomenology. Dr. Manny D. graduated AB Philosophy at the Ateneo de Manila University in 1967, MA Philosophy at the same university in 1973, and PhD Philosophy at the University of Santo Tomas in 1979. Dr. Manny has served in several administrative functions with Ateneo's former School of Arts and Sciences. He was also the chair of the philosophy department director of the Chinese Studies Program, assistant dean for student affairs, as well as the director of admissions and aid. He is currently a board member of the Faura Research Foundation Incorporated. This is his 54th year of teaching in the Ateneo. How about that? Could we please give Doc Mani a round of applause? 54 years. <laughs> Friends, please welcome Dr. Mani D. The topic of my presentation is the legacy of Ramon C. Reyes, Man and Historical Action. So I intend to discuss the following. Number one, why man and historical action? Number two, the main insight of his talk. Number three, the impact of his talk. And number four, looking forward. 
So why man and historical action? Man and historical action was a talk delivered by Dr. Ramon Reyes to the fifth annual student leader seminar development in the 70s, Tagaytay City, March 19 to 24, 1973. It is included in my book, Philosophy of Man, Selected Readings, third edition, now published by the Ateneo de Manila University Press. The book used, <coughs> used to be published by Goodwill Trading before it went bankrupt, and it was very popularly used by colleges throughout the country. Whenever I see students carrying the book in conferences for me to autograph, I would ask them, what is your favorite article in the book? And the answer is a phenomenology of love. Next question. Second, uh, be second best answer, man and historical action by no other than our beloved Dr. Ramon C. Reyes. The main insight of his talk. In his talk, Dr. Reyes speaks of our existence as the intersection or cross point of physical, interpersonal, social, historical, and existential events. Being conscious of this, we can make history. Historicity is both destiny and responsibility. Physically, it took 50 billion years for nature to develop the brain in each of us. Conscious of this, as creative agents, we can transform or deform nature through work. Interpersonally, each of us is a cross point of various personal relationships, from our mother's and father's personal lines of events to our interaction with kings and friends. Conscious of this cross point, we can, of interpersonal point, we can deliberately pull together strands of personal lines of events or separate them. So socially, we are a product of many events in our society in the past. Our Malaysian past, our Spanish past, our American past, our Japanese occupation past, forming in us social habits, which we can call culture. Conscious of this, we can be aware of our limitations and possibilities as a Filipino. Overlapping with the social is the historical point of intersection. The world events in the past, such as the history of Christianity and the history of Islam Islamism, the history of modern experimental science, the history of modern medicine, the history of industrialization, the history of the Cold War, etc. Becoming conscious of this, as historical products, we can also become aware of the historical possibilities that we have. Last but not least is the intersection between me as a unique individual person and a certain form of absolute, a certain form of an ideal, a certain form of ultimate goal for which I live. This is the existential task, which ultimately determines the meaning of our personal life. To summarize, you find, therefore, that inside as a man is a point of intersection of all these various kinds of events in all these various levels. You and I can be characterized in one sense by what we, may, we might call destiny or fate. On the other hand, you and I are also characterized by a certain creativity, therefore a certain task 
or responsibility. In short, the human person is not only a product of history, he or she can make history. The impact of the talk. The impact of the talk would come to me during the 1986 People Power in EDSA, Epifanio de los Santos Avenue, rising to the call of Cardinal Sin to go to EDSA to protect General Ramos and General Enrile from the army of President Ferdinand Marcos Sr., Doc Leo Garcia, then faculty association president, and I, then a prefect of Servini Hall, started a food brigade in front of gate four of Camp Aguinaldo with the residents of Servini Hall as our volunteers. I remember Doc Leo and I carrying huge pots of rice and hard-boiled eggs from the residence of the parents of Dr. Dairit in Green Hills to bring to the gate. We were then young and full of hope. <laughs> we, got to our we got our water from the Petron station opposite side of the highway. We were the only food brigade in the whole stretch of EDSA. Food donations poured in and we never ran out of food and drinks. In fact, when Marcos flew, <coughs> Uh, we, had, we were tr trying to convince people to, to bring home the leftover food. People line up to get their share, giving way to physically disabled persons. The residents, the resident students manned the food brigade. We had two shifts, 6 p.m. to 6, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. I started at 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. But when I got back to my room in the first floor of Servini Hall, I could not sleep because of the constant ringing of the telephone, parents asking where their sons are. My reply, don't worry, ma'am. Your son is making history. I decided then to be 24, hour, 24 hours in EDSA. Now, the talk is part of the module on embodiment in the course Philo 11.03 Live Experience Phenomenological Track, formerly Philosophy of the Human Person 1 and 2. It is complemented with Hannah Arendt's labor, work, and action, where she speaks of action as having a beginning and end, and thus unrepeatable, and can only be compensated by forgiveness and promise. The module requires a group report asking in a PowerPoint presentation what insights from Dr. Reyes and Arendt's essays are applicable to our lives. Since the assignment coincided with the campaign for the national elections, several students asked for extension of deadline because they were campaigning for Lenny and Kiko. Others gave excellent reports relating the insight of Dr. Reyes to the campaign. In short, they all felt that they were making history. Looking forward, when the elections results came in and Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and Sara Duterte won, I had to set up a Zoom meeting with my students for them and I to share feelings. I started the session admitting that I cried, but then I told them, as I texted my nephew, Kevin, that the fight is not over. There is round two. 
the making of history is not over, but ongoing, and only if we make it so. Historicity is different from history, for history is only about the past, but historicity includes the present and the future. Does history repeat itself now with Marcos Jr. as president? My colleague, Ambet Ocampo, does not think so. History does not repeat itself. We make it so. Thank you. Doc Mani, thank you. Thank you very much. And many thanks to our other three lecturers and panelists. Everyone, could we please give our speakers another round of applause to express our appreciation. <laughs> I'd like to invite Attorney Zaldi and Doc Mani to our uh, set here, our setup. And of course, Doc Leo and uh, Professor Eddie Boy will be joining us virtually. Folks, we will now begin the next part of our program, which is the panel discussion. We can only have about 10 to 15 minutes of this, and so may I ask our panelists to sort of break the ice for the discussion by quickly taking turns in sharing with us their own key takeaways from the lectures of their own panelists, from the other uh, panel uh, members. For example, Attorney Zaldi may tell us what he found striking in Dr. Leo's lecture, or Doc Leo can share with us uh, what he finds to be central to what Professor Eddie Boy told us earlier, just to get the ball rolling. This is also the segment in our event when we will ask the students in the audience here with us to be extra sharp. So, mga atinista, extra sharp tayo. Because we will uh, ask questions from you in the Q&A right after the panel discussion. Huwag niyo kami pahiyain. Kahit walang bonus kay Professor, magtanong tayo mamaya. So ladies and gentlemen, let's open the panel discussions. Simulatin with, with the, uh, our, our panel, panel members who are, who are with us, us here. Um, Doc Mani or Attorney Zaldi, any striking points that you recall from the talk of your uh, other uh, colleagues? Well, man. <laughs> so... <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a, a kind of a intellectual indigestion. <laughs> Thank you, Doc Mani. See, Attorney Zaldi. Maybe just to get it started, um, I was struck uh, both by Eddie Boy's uh, erudite exposition of the history of philosophy, the different approaches to, to the history, uh, in the sense the questions that need to be asked, uh, the, the point that philosophy is more the asking of the question, the search for the truth is never just the end of it, but the very art mm -hmm. of questioning it and Posing oneself in the in the whole flow of thought as thought develops, uh, and with uh, Dr. Leo's uh, uh, lecture, the idea that uh, there is a difference between ethics and morality, and that one is not necessarily superior to the other but that there is a certain dialectic that needs to, uh, in a way, discern the movement from one to the other to best uh, address the situation. Um, I think that um, that puts us right at the core of Doc Reyes's teachings, uh, his quest for ethics in a way it's perplexing that on one hand he would talk about different philosophers and always say what 
one says or what the other says or would have said, but on the other hand, somehow recognizes that there is something inherent, something that is uh, common, underlying, an underlying thread that uh, runs through them. Uh, I wish Eddie Boy would, uh, Mr. Calasans would talk more about uh, his views. It would be, it would make for an interesting uh, three unit course. Um, the philosophy of the history of philosophy, uh, as it were. <laughs> Sir Eddie Boy, let, let me give you the, the, the mic, mic or the audio. audio. Yeah, that, that just to pick up from what uh, Salvi just, uh, just uh, said, what, what really struck me in uh, what has been shared uh, today is uh, <laughs> Without, without really much con, uh, concerting with one another, uh, I think uh, one can get a sense of uh, uh, perhaps what can be boldly uh, called uh, uh, a philosophical tradition in the Ateneo philosophy department. Uh, uh, even in, uh, if you paid attention to certain uh, uh, certain uh, linguistic habits, you know, the propensity to, 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 to do on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, <laughs> which is very, which is very uh, Doc Reyes uh, uh, discourse, but it also shows uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, this need, uh, first of all, to, to always to, to uh, try to appreciate the truth of uh, different positions, even contrary positions, no? not, not, to, not to engage immediately in, uh, in, in a frontal polemic, but really to, to, to see beyond uh, uh, and uh, to see beyond the, the initial, initial positions, to, to see a deeper, deeper synthesis, a deeper uh, reconciliation. I, I think this is uh, really part of the the way of doing philosophy that has been that has been uh, uh, inculcated in us as students in the, in, the, in, the, in the philosophy department, and perhaps just as a historical uh, background, when when the philosophy department was set up, was uh, uh, organized, reorganized, and the philosophy program of studies uh, set up in the 1960s, not starting 1965. Uh, it, it, it's very interesting to note that the, the founders, so to speak, of the department were of various uh, uh, philosophical orientations, you know, they, like Father Ferriols, of course, uh, but uh, also Dr. Reyes, Father Riley, uh, Father Green, and uh, the orientations were different, and uh, there were some heated debates uh, once in a while, polite but heated. Uh, and, but that goes to show us that uh, uh, a certain plurality uh, was always uh, uh, in the in the in the in the in the atmosphere of a certain plurality of thinking was in the atmosphere of the, of the philosophy department, and 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 lastly uh, the, the the suggestion of uh, Saldi concerning a, a, a reflection on. The, uh, the philosophy of the history of philosophy. Uh, as a matter of fact, it has been one of my, uh, well, uh, concerns, uh, probably an aborted uh, project, it's not the only one uh, that I have, uh, to, re to really re reflect on uh, the meaning of the history of philosophy. And, and this is part of perhaps a, a bigger enterprise, to, to, which is very, uh, relevant, I think, uh, today, not just in the Philippines, but uh, uh, different uh, parts of the whole world, to really reflect on the meaning of history. Uh, I think it is important to avoid, uh, on the one hand, to go back to that way of thinking, uh, on the one hand, a certain view of history as monolithic, a sort of Hegelian world vision, uh, everything ending up in uh, 
uh, in the in the in the in the paradise of uh, the absolute spirit. But on the other hand, to avoid also a view of history which is uh, scattered, uh, uh, dispersed uh, in pure uh, dissemination, as, uh, as Derrida uh, would say, would there be, uh, would there be uh, another alternative that one can, uh, well, hope for? <coughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not certain if we have the, the, the tools or the vocabulary to, to express this uh, in a more systematic way, but I, I, I think it's really worth reflecting uh, on. Is there uh, a logic, uh, an order, a sense, a meaning, a direction in history? Hola. Thank you, sir, Eddie Boy. That's certainly a project worth looking into. Maybe our grad students here might want to take you up on that uh, challenge. Doc Leo, uh, what are your thoughts or uh, response or reaction maybe to all the, the, the three lectures you've heard? Uh, yeah, I, I think I already um, commented on Saudi and Mr. Kalasans, uh, but I, I think, uh, yeah, th there, there is a, a certain, um, I think, um, what, what I, what comes to mind is that, uh, I, there, there is a, um, the University of Louvain, the Catholic University of Louvain, uh, prizes the history of philosophy in, and everyone is a specialist in a certain philosopher. And that adds to the, the greatness of the Institute because uh, they, they have a kind of reading program uh, a, phil a philosophy professor would take a five-year uh, program uh, tracing an idea beginning with Plato uh, for one year, Aristotle the next year, uh, St. Thomas the next year, Kant the next year. And one will profit from that professor if, uh, you know, if if he or she has run the gamut of the philosophical um, history, I think uh, you should be specialized in one, but you should get interested in other philosophers. Uh, I think I remember you should choose at least from three to five philosophers because one cannot do more than five, I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I, I, and I think this is also done through a lot of, uh, a lot of talking together. <coughs> like uh, Dr. Reyes was very good in, you know, he would sit at the bench there, uh, fronting the door of the philosophy department and it would be his courteous not to engage him in some conversations. Uh, so <clears throat> I think he had a he had a way of uh, solicit uh, yeah engaging you in conversation, and in a way of getting from you secrets. He would nod his head. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> and. Uh, without telling some of his secrets, of course. Yeah, so <laughs> that's what I noticed. So I think th there, there is a kind of collegiality of exchange. If you have that in a department, the department becomes stronger. Wonderful, Wonderful thoughts. thoughts, very, very good, good thoughts, thoughts there, Dr. Thank, thank you so, thank so much. much. I wanted to, uh, engage uh, Tony Zaldi with his observa observation earlier or his recall of how our beloved Dr. Reyes really had his own brand when he was in the classroom, own brand of teaching. Uh, Dr. Strebel also mentioned that at the start. Uh, I, 
when I was a student, I, I myself was fascinated um, of how he could how could he could handle an entire lecture without bringing notes and without having a lot of gaps in his uh, in his speech. He would just give you a lecture, and if you didn't know any better, you'd think that he was actually reading off uh, the page of, a, of a, an essay. And at the same time, what you referred to, he would just out of nowhere stand up and use the blackboard to start illustrating some, some point. So my question to the, to the panelists, or, or I'd like to ask you to just give us a little, uh, uh, a little comment or, uh, or uh, memory perhaps of how you remember Doc Reyes as a teacher. Um, in the classroom. Attorney Doc Mani? I was a student when I was <coughs> in senior year, and <coughs> I had him for several, sub for several subjects, especially philosophy of history. And then uh, what I would do is I would take down notes. And then when I get back to the dorm, I would type my notes. Okay? And at the end of the course, I would give him my notes, typewritten, and he really appreciated that, you know. In my case, uh, it was always uh, a trip uh, every time I attended uh, Dr. Reyes's class. History, of modern and contemporary philosophy, for example, uh, was an exercise of becoming a Cartesian for several weeks, then becoming a Humean for uh, several other weeks. In a way, he would always be lost in his lectures. Uh, the illustrations were for me uh, some, or when he does his illustrations, it seemed to me like he was like a tour guide who pointed to us uh, the different aspects, the different sides, the different uh, uh, angles of this worldview that he was trying to make us embrace. And so, as I was saying, it was more than just a content course, it was really a, a way of thinking course. So that uh, one, uh, after reading, after going through Kant, for example, one begins to see the world or imagine seeing the world the way Kant would probably see it. And in that sense, it was effective that he would spend a lot of time on one philosopher rather than talk about one philosopher to the next and come up with a doxology as um, Mr. Kalasans was saying. He was, in a way, making us live the philosopher and in that way make us appreciate what that point of view may really entail. And uh, that, that, that for me was fascinating. And of course, the, the erudition and the eloquence was um, unmistakably doc. I never heard him stammer. I never heard him uh, grasp for words somehow, these always just flowed out of his uh, mouth, and um, consistently so. Uh, the, 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 even the tone of his voice, even the, even the demeanor in which he says it, uh, is so typically doc, and uh, it's simply what? What can I say? Um, I'm in awe, as, uh, as, I, uh, as I still am. I can so well relate with that, attorney. Uh, I remember, yes, yeah, sapiencia eloquencia. I remember uh, my evening classes with Doc would always end up with me and my batchmates walking out of the classroom and uh, continuing philosophy. And I think it was that time I, I started geeking out on philosophy, thanks to Dr. Reyes. Sir Eddie Boy, uh, Dennis, uh, Doc Leo. Dennis, yeah, I. I remember uh, I never had Dr. Reyes because I, I already graduated, but uh, between the two years uh, while, I, while waiting for a scholarship in 1966, I attended his classes 
And uh, I remember once in Bergman's Hall, he was lecturing. Uh, it was in late class. And suddenly, uh, the electricity was cut off. And I thought he would stop, but he continued. Uh, he continued lecturing in the dark. And it was very, uh, well, it was very amusing because he was talking about Kant and the Enlightenment, but he, it was in darkness. So, <laughs> and uh, I think uh, we should remember that uh, Ramon Reyes was, uh, was the voice of the democracy winner. So he's in, uh, he won the, I think he, he this, uh, in the Ateneos, there was a voice of democracy uh, speech contest. And I think he won one uh, in his, uh, during his years at Ateneo, voice of democracy. That's why, uh, he never stammered and he's a good speaker because of that. Thank you. He was he also, was also uh, the first, first Metro Bank Outstanding Teacher Awardee. Yeah, the <coughs> Metro Bank. Sir Eddie Sir Boy, Eddie you can have the last uh, voice for this segment of our event. Uh, uh, Zaldi mentioned you know, that when uh, even though I, I was not in uh, Dr. Reyes's classes in uh, the history of modern and, and contemporary philosophy, he was my teacher. I took uh, two classes with him. It was a seminar style. We had it at the office of the Department of Philosophy uh, chair. Uh, uh, it was a course on, uh, one course on Kant, and the other, we read through uh, significant parts of the Critique of Pure Reason and another course on Heidegger, read through uh, Being and Time. But I think what uh, characterizes his teaching when he, he, he teaches a, a, a philosopher is that he makes the questions of the philosopher your personal question. You know, the questions of, uh, of somebody as, as highly speculative, as uh, abstract, even as, as, as Kant, for example, uh, he, he has the gift of making the questions of the philosopher uh, existential, you know, as if uh, that such that they, they, they matter in our everyday lives. They matter in our uh, moral decision making. They matter in our uh, choices concerning one's uh, lifetime vocation, concerning one's love life. I mean, uh, just imagine, you know, Kant being uh, a guide to your love life. But he, he had a gift for that, you know, to making the questions of the philosopher uh, existential, uh, dramatic. Uh, for, for, for him, even, even a Kant or a, a Hegel uh, or an, uh, a Habermas, an Appel, uh, they, they were dramatic. You know? And I, I, I think it's, it's, it, it's something that uh, uh, I hope we we don't lose in the in uh, our teaching in our pedagogy in the department uh, to to make uh, the study of philosophy really uh, a dramatic experience. Thank you, Sir Eddie Boy. Folks, Folks, that concludes our panel, panel discussion. discussion. We now, now open, open our space, space for some, some questions, questions coming, coming from you, from our audience. audience. Please be limited to just one question from yourself, so that we could share the time with other audience members. You may address, of course, your question to any of our panelists. So the floor is now open for your questions. There are four microphones stationed close to you. Good evening. Good evening. 
evening. My name is Milky Zedek Imuan. Uh, my question is, and of course, uh, this is my first time actually encountering um, Dr. Ramon Reyes uh, in any way whatsoever. And uh, what I found interesting is that uh, a, co a common thread among the discussions in the panel uh, is Dr. Ramon Reyes as a teacher of uh, moral philosophy of ethics. And uh, from what I'm gathering, uh, the way that, he, uh, as uh, Professor Kalasan said, uh, he made the questions that these philosophers ask so relevant in, in our lives. And that led me to think, uh, what would it be like uh, had Dr. Roman Reyes taught a course on the philosophy of the human person? Uh, what, what would you think his approach would be and uh, why would it be that way? Yeah, let me answer the question. Uh, in my time, we were not uh, the the core uh, the core curriculum the core courses in philosophy uh, was metaphysics. Okay, five units. Uh, so five, no, actually six units. Okay, <laughs> six units. Uh, we were discussing being. Uh, Monday to Friday, and then this, the Saturday would be a reading time day. And then Father Cruz took over the philosophy department in 1967, okay, and rebumped the core for curriculum course. Uh, it became, the, it, it was the beginning of the phenomenological method. So, uh, I was trained under the, the metaphysics and then when I got into the department in 97, I was tasked to teach the, the philosophy of the human person, uh, one and two. And we had to undergo a seminar, summer seminar, uh, for teaching the course in the coming semester. And Dr. Reyes was one of the, uh, one of the speakers uh, for teaching that course. So he actually took part in the, in, the, in, the, in the curriculum of the philosophy of the human person. He was familiar with the existential uh, phenomenological method. Uh, and he was one of the speakers there. Okay. <laughs> so that gives you an idea that he was actually part of that uh, curriculum of the philosophy of the human person. just going to say, I actually asked that same question myself um, a few years back. I, I've always wondered myself how uh, Doc would have approached it. Uh, philo, uh, feel of the human person, we used to just call it feel of man. Feel the feel, feel of the human person being um, focused on one tradition and uh, somehow, uh, although part of it, uh, on the one hand, it could have been approached probably historically, uh, so some comparison of how the, the understanding of man has grown in history, how it would have been in the ancient times and uh, how it's relevant. But then again, it could have been that that was uh, being the first philosophy course in, in uh, that um, Ateneo students take doing a, a, a historical approach at the onset may not develop in the student the kind of discipline that being exposed only to one tradition first um, achieves. And uh, my best guess is he would have refrained from teaching it and would have stayed on to uh, would have stayed on with Philo 104, Foundations of Moral Value, uh, on the assumption that students would have had some maturity already, would have had some uh, extensive exposure to doing philosophy, albeit in 
one tradition. Actually, in that summer seminar, he was he contributed to the embodiment part of the of the course. So, the readings were from him, uh, the, like what I mentioned: historicity, uh, temporality, facticity, transcendence. These were all his contributions to the course. Thank you, Doc Mani, Attorney Zaldi. Friends, could we give a round of applause to our fellow audience member who uh, shared a question with us? <laughs> Sir Eddie Boy? I was joined to say that uh, 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 Dr. Reyes actually did teach uh, Philo 101, 102 during my time. Uh, I, I belong to the generation between uh, Mani B and Salvi Mirasol. No? So during my time, he actually taught. I had friends who, uh, who were his students in philosophy of man. And he used a textbook as a starting point. I remember the title, The World of Persons by Winkel Winkelmans de Kleti, who, who was a graduate of uh, uh, Louvain. And as uh, uh, was mentioned, the, uh, as Mani B mentioned, the themes of embodiment, temporality, uh, historicity, uh, uh, these were the key themes for, for in his philosophy of, uh, of, of man course. Mm, not so much love, uh, that became Mani B's uh, specialization, uh, but certainly embodiment, temporality, uh, historicity, and uh, being towards death. Uh, so he did teach uh, a philosophy of man in an existential phenomenological way, uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, Heidegger were his uh, principal uh, sources. Voila. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Sir Eddie Boy. We have yeah. room for one more question, especially maybe from our students who are taking up ethics courses right now or our philo majors. So you nagtanong kanina may gift certificate sa akin yan galing Starbucks. Joke, ah, joke. Kinana incentive. There, here we go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Azrael Pilarta, and I would like to ask my question primarily to Attorney Mirasol. And the idea of you already addressed the idea that Dr. Reyes had had the idea of pushing for the principle of trying to embrace the ideas of opposites. But now, especially in the time of the youth now, of which the concept of taking hot takes of taking your opinion right here, right now, and saying it out to the world is already such a popular idea with us now. How do you, would you think that Dr. Reyes would approach these popular, I, this popular idea, especially since, you know, <laughs> sir, forgive me, especially now in this popular idea that people are no longer willing to go up and embrace, as you say, embrace the opposite of what they believe in. Tolerance uh, is that is the is that I, I just wanted to make sure I, I understood the question. Uh, so you're speaking essentially of the intolerance that people tend to have nowadays. Yeah. yeah. On, on the one hand, uh, he would approach it, I think, from by by looking at the different aspects uh, attending. What are the circumstances of the case? What is the particular context? Is this the age of social media, for example, when the flow of information is so accessible and so fast and so widespread? Uh, and understand it, and probably ask the question, how would it have been, been if this happened at the, uh, in the age prior to social media, when the influence of, when opinions were more sifted and the spread was more limited. Um, a large part of it, I, I just suspect, I, difficult, probably something that uh, I will be thinking over, uh, continue to think over um, uh, through the night, but that is, his, his view, I think, would, would 
take uh, to a certain extent an understanding of the situation and how this can be a reaction to something or the result of something. And on the other hand, at the same time, part of the approach is understanding the good that may come out of this. Uh, there is that always, I always get that sense from him that problems should never be viewed as the ultimate destiny of things, that these are stages and that awareness of the problem and awareness of its implications would give us a better understanding of solutions and when we finally get to those points of, the, of, 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 of resolutions, we'll realize that after all, the problem may even have been necessary. Uh, a lot of, for example, in the field of law, a lot of developments, great developments, strides, uh, human rights, civil rights, rights of women to vote in many instances, we're never, uh, we're never there at the beginning. Uh, they were always the result, or they were always in a way preceded by a conflict before the opposite. I'm sorry, but this is probably a, a Hegelian moment, uh, if, if you ask me, uh, as you also pointed out. Uh, and a necessary moment, because uh, it helps us understand the, the structure of consciousness that somehow we never really understand the good right away. Not, it doesn't manifest itself right away. It helps to see events and sometimes opposing events, the antithesis, to see that uh, the, these events can lead to actually a greater growth, a greater uh, a movement for the better in the evolution of things. Thank you, Attorney Zaldi. Could we give, uh, could we applaud our friend over here who asked that uh, very good question? And of course, everyone, please join me in saying thanks to our four panelists with a round of applause, please. And now it pleases me to invite Maria Carmen Alquaz Reyes to share with us her and her family's response to our discussions tonight. Everyone, please welcome Mrs. Reyes. I haven't stood in front of a microphone in a long time, so I don't know what that is. Good afternoon, everyone. Students who were asked by their professors to attend this lecture, <laughs> lovers of philosophy, friends. Thank you for your presence here this afternoon. Thank you to the philosophy department for organizing this panel discussion, to Father Bobby Yap for his opening remarks, to the four panelists, Dr. Leo Garcia, Attorney Salvi Mirasol, Mr. Eddie Boy Calasanz, and Mr. Manidi, all very good friends of Ramon and of our family, for their keeping Ramon's legacy alive throughout their pres through their presentations and lively discussion just done. And thank you to all those who worked behind the scenes to make this event possible, both here with us as online. I was also asked to share some memories of Ramon. So I'm going to talk to you about the other side of the man, the non-philosopher. We will try to uh, spice up my talk with some photographs, but I'm not sure whether we will be coordinated because we did not practice. <laughs> okay. Unlike some of his contemporaries who started out teaching here at the Ateneo, but left academe 
for more lucrative, better paying jobs, Ramon remained with the Ateneo from the time he returned from his studies in Louvain in 1966 until 2013, when he could no longer teach class because he was in and out of the hospital for about eight months. Even as he had been bedridden, he still dreamt of returning to the classroom. Teaching was his vocation. He once said, while recovering from one of his trips to the hospital, if I cannot teach, I might as well die. What got him to teaching? Let me give you a very quick peek at his journey. Here I need the pictures of the mother now. Ramon was the eldest of 10 children of Dr. Narciso Reyes from Malolos, Bulacan and Natividad Castillo from Tiaong, Quezon. Narciso worked in North General Hospital and the Belibid prisons. He grew up, this is Ramon, who grew up in Concepcion Aguila, Quiapo. After the war, he studied very briefly at San Beda College before moving to the Ateneo. He said he just used to walk over the pipe or something to Barillas to go from his house to San Beda. He was in the 2B, 3C class that had Father, can you switch to Father Arevalo now? That had Father Catalino Arevalo who just passed on in January as their class moderator. Hmm. I'm surprised here, Pao. <laughs> Do you see any boys there in shorts? No, not there, okay. Anyway, he graduated high school in 1952. He, it was mentioned earlier that he was a Voice of Democracy winner. Actually, he was the first Voice of Democracy winner and this contest was sponsored by the JCs. The prize he got was a speaking tour around the US. That's him declaiming his piece on what democracy is. And this is he talking to a group. When they got to college, their class asked for a special curriculum in the humanities and such a curriculum was developed for them. I don't know if any of you have heard of his vocation story. Some may have, but I'm going to tell it to you. After graduation from college, he had a job offer from King Doromal to join what I believe was PRC and a challenge from Father Conkel to spend two years teaching in St. Mary's College in Bayungbong, Nueva Vizcaya. Much against the wishes of his parents, he took the long five, six hour bus ride to Bayombong. The priest, ICM priest, Belgian priest who met him, explained what his teaching load would be and showed him the room where he would live. After seeing his sleeping quarters and bathroom with no hot water for a shower, he got back on the bus home and went back to Father Kunkel. He told Father Kunkel that he could not take the job at St. Mary's. So Father Conkel had a discussion with him and then seemed to accept his decision. But as Ramon was going out the door, Father Conkel shot out a question at him. Oh, Ramon, when your children ask you what you did for a living, will you tell them you, sell, you sold soap? That did it. He went right back to Bayongbong and taught there for two years. He once told me that his two years in St. Mary's was like a JVP, Jesuit Volunteers Philippines assignment. There was no JVP program yet then. After him, there are two other Athenians who came and taught there also. It was there that he realized that he could be a teacher. The Belgian priest must have seen his talent and suggested he go to Louvain for further studies. He took that challenge and spent a good seven years from 1958 to 1965 learning French, focusing on his studies, and soaking up European culture. He earned his doctorate in philosophy, I believe it was with distinction. There you see some pictures from Louvain. Now when he came back to the Philippines, he was much in demand. My college professor, 
Dr. Walda Perfecto, who was the academic vice president at De La Salle College, offered him a position with double the whatever salary the Ateneo would pay him. He didn't know how much he was getting. <laughs> he chose his alma mater, joining the philosophy department in 1965 or 66, where together with Father Jose A. Cruz and Father Roque Ferriols, they introduced and crafted a new curriculum, a curriculum that directed what the tradition of the philo department fundamentally is now, existential phenomenology. But there was more to Ramon Reyes than the academician, mentor, and educator. I will share a few memories in three categories, trying to be Jesuit. <laughs> Ramon the family man, Ramon the non-philosopher, and some endearing qualities we miss most about him. He was a devoted family man. Married at the age of 37 in 1972, he had two sons. Javier Paolo in 1979 and Inigo Rafael in 1982. Paolo somewhere at the back and Rafa is down here on the second row. Let me see. What was it like being married to Ramon? He allowed me to be me. He didn't expect me to cook his meals, prepare his clothes, or be home by a specific time. We each had our careers, both at the Ateneo. He as philosophy professor, department chair, and influential person in the School of Arts and Sciences. I as faculty member of the psychology department and director of Central Guidance Bureau. We had different schedules and our own cars and drove to work separately. I went in the morning and he usually came in the afternoon and went home at night. It was the cl philo classes, many of them were late night classes. The Hatid Sundu for the boys' classes was dependent on who was available, helped immeasurably by carpooling with good friends and neighbors. I was then active in consulting work with government and business organizations and would on occasion be away for a few days. He never complained, but he teased me calling me Batang Kalye. <coughs> We had our own professional circles, <coughs> sorry, and conferences and participated in them, usually with one of us staying home to be with the children. However, when it was a Paasco conference in, or a philosophical conference in the Philippines where spouses were welcome, I would go with him to listen to the paper that he had been working on for endless nights. That was not something to be missed. I think, Sally, it was who mentioned that Ramon was a student all throughout. Um, I do agree with that because every time he would teach a course, and this is usually every year, uh, I thought he had enough books in his study, but he would order more books. It was always some new book that he was learning, and I still have them at home or give away to the, <laughs> to the department or to the Ateneo. Okay. As an aside, I feel our children were deprived in not being allowed to attend his philosophy classes. That was his unwritten rule. I do know that his philosophy classes were very interesting because some of my friends and also my niece would tell us stories. But I think he subtly told the kids, don't enroll in my class, I won't be able to tell stories. <laughs> in fact, one time, a niece of mine was there, and he says, told someone, you have to remind me that she's in this class. <laughs> okay. Ramon was a homebody, a constant, reassuring, predictable presence. So we had a certain routine of activities. On Sundays, when my mom was still alive, and that's up to 1986, we would go to Campanilla, to my ancestral home, for Sunday lunch with her and my siblings. When the boys were older, our Sunday routine was late morning mass at Mary the Queen or Santuario de San Jose, grocery at Unimark, and home for lunch. After lunch, you would sit around the coffee table and have ice cream and barquillos. Ramon loved ice cream, all the way to the time he could no longer have ice cream. For dinner, we would go often to Quezon City Sports Club 
where he would enjoy a good thick steak. I understand that he also loved the uh, uh, big burgers. Sometimes that's what he would be eating when he was here in the department, right? For vacations, we would go to Baguio for three or four days, usually after summer classes, off season. He enjoyed driving for six or more hours to Green Valley near Mount Santo Tomas. We would stop for lunch at the tourist center at the foot of Cannon Road. The favorite places to visit were Burnham Park and Camp John Hay for biking and running around, Mario's for a good dinner, and of course, Good Shepherd for peanut brittle and strawberry jam, and the market for vegetables, strawberries, and walis before going home to Quezon City. Okay, there you see a picture of Ramon with the two boys. That's one of my favorite pictures. In the late 90s, our vacation destination switched to Barakay, where we would walk along the beach, eat a hearty meal, or just sit around relaxing in the balcony of our rented house. I have to inject that Ramon loved a siesta also. He was a night person, and so therefore he needed a siesta. Ramon enjoyed a good game of bridge. Before I met him, he had regular bridge nights with a chosen few friends. When we were together, my cousins, the Alberts, became the bridge bodies way into the night. He gave this up when we had children as they became our focus. Now I move to a few endearing qualities we miss about him. Sometimes they were not endearing, sometimes they were. <laughs> <laughs> Ramon was methodical. Whether it be counting the money paid and the number of mimeographed articles bought by students before leaving the philo office when he was chairman, this is when they still had the thick books and all that. Maybe you don't have that anymore now. Whether it be, or, or carefully storing the groceries in our pantry using the first in, first out principle, or the daily check of his car battery. Not only was he methodical, he was a do-it-yourself man. The boys remember he would repair their toys. He could do minor electrical and plumbing work. He would also clamber up on our roof to check for leaks after a strong rain and apply the sealant himself. You see that roof there with the arrow? That's Paolo with his father and Father Joseph O'Hare, who was his best friend. So he would put the stairs there clamber up onto the roof of the garage, and then go over to the roof of our house and check every leak. We had a placa romana roof, and it wasn't very sturdy. So he also made it a point to step on the right places, and he would not allow anyone else to climb that roof because they might get more tears, you know. Okay. He would check his car battery, think around the car, but most of all, he took great care of his car. There was an artist in this philosopher. He liked pottering around the garden, trimming the plants. He bought a few paintings he could afford and hung them very precisely on our walls. He was a very good dancer, taking after both parents, but it took a long while for him to get out on the dance floor. I would tell him, come on, let's dance. And he'd say, no, you dance with them. No, I want to dance. Finally, when he'd get up on the dance floor, he would throw me around. He was all fired up, and he wouldn't stop until he was out of breath. But you had to kind of light a fire under him. <laughs> and he loved to play the piano. Take, uh, his mother, who was a pianist, had taught him the basics. He had a very good ear for music playing oído. He had a lot of piano books and happily improvised on them. The piano was his refuge, both his recreation and therapy. He could sit for hours in our living room in his favorite room, passionately playing jazz improvisations. Sometimes they were too loud and distracting for me, so I would retreat to our bedroom. Not so our neighbors who happened to be passing by and would stop to listen and enjoy the music and the artistry. Now I am very sorry I didn't tape his mini concerts. Did he have a social life? 
Ramon was rather introverted, but he enjoyed the company of good friends. He was a great storyteller, something those of you who were his students and colleagues must have experienced. Just the right words, right timing, and punchline. Sometimes I used to get suya with him because I would have told him a story, and then he would tell me the story back, and it had frills already. And I said, no, but I'm the, one, I'm the originator of that story. How come it looks better now? <laughs> he looked forward to the birthday celebrations of our gang of married couples, mutual friends developed over the years. Whether it was quiet storytelling, lively discussions, a delicious meal, or a night of singing and piano playing, he really had a good time, and we stayed on till the end of the party. Likewise, the dinners after college commencement exercises, where he was usually the master of ceremonies. These were held at the garden outside the Jesuit residence, where you could see the lights in the valley. Pleasant opportunities for bonding with colleagues. As usual, we would be the last to leave. So there you have a peek of the other side of Ramon, the teacher and mentor. Little bits about him outside the work setting. Before I conclude, I must add that Ramon was a very patient man, non-confrontational, but courageous, accepting of people and situations as they were. During the many weeks of hospital confinement and in his bedridden condition at home, he never complained, not when they feed, were feeding him through a peg or when he strayed had to be cleared with a machine. He still maintained the hope that he would be able to speak again and ultimately teach again. His nurse, Carlo, told us that he had learned a lot from him, from Sir Ramon, while ministering to his needs. Even on his sick bed, he was still teaching. If you think about it, that would be expected as he often told us, if I cannot teach, I might as well die. Ramon was a man of multiple dimensions and a teacher by vocation and at heart. He left us quietly on January 17, 2014, surrounded by Rafa, Pablo, myself, a close group of friends. Among them was Leo and Eddie Boy Calasanas and his caregivers. Today, we, his family, appreciate and thank everyone for the initiatives to keep his memory alive. Thank you for your presence here to honor Ramon Castillo Reyes, a man of integrity who was true to his vocation as family man, teacher, philosopher, and son of God to the very end. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Reyes. Your words about your beloved late husband have truly enriched our memorial lectures. Before we conclude tonight's memorial lectures, please note that light snacks are available at the lobby of this auditorium right after our event. We now call on the Dean of the Ateneo School of Humanities for some closing remarks. Our Dean will be uh, talking to us virtually. Friends, please welcome Dr. Jonathan Chua. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Father Roberto Yap, uh, Mrs. Reyes, and members of the Reyes family, um, uh, Dr. Shrebel, distinguished guests, uh, good evening. We've uh, heard a lot uh, about Dr. Reyes, Ramon Reyes, from his colleagues and friends. Uh, I actually feel embarrassed and envious uh, because I was never uh, well acquainted with him when I was in college. Uh, I knew him only as the author of Ground in Our Morality. Uh, the textbook for uh, Philo 104 or Foundations of Moral Value. And later as an instructor at the Ben School of Arts and Sciences, um, I recall being told uh, what he was going to spend his sabbatical on, uh, and that was to read Immanuel Kant. Now, I thought that that was such a privilege uh, to be able to read what you want without having to worry about making a living. Uh, but that's really the side of, I guess, of uh, 
Dr. Reyes as the eternal student as uh, I think Atonio Mirasol who said that. Um, from the stories I heard back then and uh, corroborated by what the speaker said this evening, uh, it's clear that Dr. Reyes was a pillar, uh, not only of the department, but also of the, pillar of the university. Uh, and uh, in his various roles as teacher, administrator, accreditor, uh, he enriched it and left an extensive legacy. Generations of intellectuals, public servants, teachers, professionals, uh, people of goodwill, I guess, and people of ethics. I guess in that way, he lived out his own um, insight that we make history and he made history as Dr. Reyes. So it is only fitting that the Ramon Reyes Memorial Lectures have been revived after two years of hibernation uh, and may his memory live on and his work continue to inspire others if only for lowly instructors to aspire for a paid sabbatical or uh, more philosophically put, uh, what can I hope for and what must I do to get there, Ed Boy Calasans. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers, Dr. Garcia, uh, Tony Mirasol, uh, Dr. D, Mr. Calasans, uh, the organizers of this lecture, the family of Dr. Reyes, represented by um, um, Carmen Alcuas uh, Reyes, and the philosophy department headed by Dr. Shrebel. Uh, thank you and uh, good evening to all. Thank you, Dr. Chua. Friends, that concludes the 2023 Ramon Castillo Reyes Memorial Lectures. Thank you for being part of this special event. Thank you for honoring Dr. Reyes with your presence here tonight. And above all, we of the philosophy department thank you in advance for the way you will preserve and grow the philosophical legacies of our beloved Dr. Ramon Reyes. Have a good evening, everyone. God's blessings to all.